Marjorie, and thank and thanks to you and Joe and colleagues for organising and for inviting me. He's a very tough act to follow, isn't he, Michael Marmot? But what I hope I can show is how engagement with communities and how community organisations, assets and resources like opportunities around adult education and adult lifelong learning can really help to address some of these sorts of uh, structural and societal inequalities that Michael has talked so um, adeptly about. So our research is um, has really focused on what we call the biopsychosocial impacts of community-based engagement. And what I mean by biopsychosocial is really everything that happens across the whole body and within a person and their role in society. And we've mostly worked with individuals um, and organisations who are working with individuals who are not typical users of what we'll call cultural assets, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So people, for example, who are not visiting their museums and are not engaged in their library, they're not going to any adult education classes, they're not going to the community centre, they're not going down to their local park or their local canal. And what we've been introduced is how we can get audiences like that to be more active in their communities and what the benefits might be for them, but also what some of the challenges to participation are for those sorts of individuals. So typically people from the most deprived areas of communities is who we've tended to focus our work on. We've also focused a lot on understanding the methods to try and um, access information about what those sorts of barriers and benefits might be. Um, I can explain why that is in more detail if it, people are interested, but one of the biggest challenges that Michael's already talked about is developing the right sorts of evidence to convince people that change needs to happen. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that and particularly working with health partners since that's who we've worked with a lot. And then more recently thinking about how we can translate research into policy and practice, both for individual organisations within communities, um, changing the way that they're operating and how they can work more collaboratively with each other and, for example, health or local authority partners, particularly with a view to addressing uh, inequalities in society. So we'll talk a little bit about these different sorts of approaches that we've had and give you some of the sorts of data and evidence that we've collated over the years and then think a little bit about how we've been looking to try and translate that sort of evidence into something meaningful for individuals and communities within societies, which is a, a work in progress and, and that's why it's so great to hear from you guys um, and understand what your interests are in, in relation to adults um, and particularly for lifelong learning and I'll explain why that is in a minute. So when we talk about community assets, we're talking about really any resources, um, organisations or individuals within communities that, as Foot and Hopkins have identified, have natural assets, social assets, cultural assets. And what we're interested in is how we can identify and mobilise these sorts of assets to help overcome the challenges that they face. So this is why we're talking about things like museums or libraries or community centres. Um, it might be green spaces, it might be blue spaces, but it also includes, includes things like social networks or groups uh, where individuals can get together to um, take advantage of being part of a community. And the reason that we talk about community assets is because it's sort of catch all term for all of those organisations and individuals within communities that are looking to service members within their community. But as we all know, those are the areas, those individuals and those organisations that have been least well served in terms of funding. And I know that's probably of interest to a lot of your um, members today. One of the best examples of integration of community assets within the community is the Bromley Bio Centre. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Bromley Bio Centre and we've worked with these guys for many years. And they set up an integrated service model um, over 20 odd years ago now, which is integrates primary care with a whole series of other types of community assets. They're set in a park, they have a church, they have a nursery, they have a cafe, they have a visual art space and an art studio. And as part of that asset, that both natural and cultural asset, they've got a whole series of services and resources and community based activities that they offer to support integration within their community. Now, that's the kind of resource that all of us, I think, would love to have in our community, isn't it? But the difficulty is how we can get those sorts of resources integrated into the communities that need it most, into those most deprived communities that Michael was talking about. 
Well, one of the opportunities around that that's come up uh, about recently, although it's not a new concept, is something called social prescribing. I'm guessing many of your viewers today have heard of social prescribing. It's now been integrated as a core component into the NHS's universal personalised care plan. And social prescribing is simply a way for um, individuals within the health professional uh, profession across anywhere in the health profession. So it could be GPs, it could be um, social workers. Um, to help refer individuals with a whole range of different challenges and, and problems in their lives to sources of support in the community. Um, within the NHS model of a social prescribing plan, this is done through what's called a social prescribing link worker. And what link workers do is help people focus on what they're calling what matters to me. And the NHS have committed to employing over 4,000 link workers over the next few years. Already about two and a half thousand, three thousand link workers have already been employed and there are more coming on stream. But link workers have actually been around and community connectors and those sorts of roles have been around for a very long time. Um, and so they're already building into this augmented uh, workforce to tackle some of these major public health issues. Um, this is just a brief diagram showing some of those pathways into social prescribing. Social prescribing is by no means the only answer to these sorts of social problems, but it provides at least one avenue to help connect people to sources of support in their community from primary care at least. Um, and the biggest area I guess of interest for all of us is the referral to an activity or community based or voluntary based activity or service or programme or opportunity within the community. So I think for community organisations that presents, of course, both an opportunity, but also a challenge. And the biggest challenge is, of course, always around funding and sustainability of the services and uh, offers that they have. And we can talk perhaps a little bit more about that in the discussion, because I know that will be of interest to, to your audience. What we're seeing recently since social prescribing has been launched into funding strategies uh, and commissioning is that social prescribing is emerging as a strategy for tackling health inequities through partnerships between primary care and third sector. Um, and again, that's both a challenge, I think, and an opportunity for all those different participants and players. You'll hear in a minute about integrated care systems and they're the new uh, avenue for um, organising our health and social care and community services within local authorities and NHS trusts. And there are new opportunities around social prescribing within that system. However, it's not without challenges for both the community side of the set spectrum, but also the health partners within that side of the spectrum. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We've been doing this sort of uh, research into the efficacy of things like social prescribing for a long time. And I'm not going to talk lots about our different types of research that we've done, but I thought I'd just give you one example of the kinds of ways that we've been working on tackling some of these gritty problems. This is a project that we completed a few years ago and here we were really testing out the idea of whether social prescribing could be transferred to museums. Some of you might have heard of libraries on prescription and you'll definitely have heard of things like arts on prescription. Arts on prescription has been around in the UK for about 30 years often running at quite small scales, working with relatively small numbers of quite vulnerable audiences usually, often working in close consultation with, for example, mental health services. And what we were interested in is, given the huge number of assets that we have around museums, we've got around two and a half thousand registered museums in the UK, we were interested to know whether museums as a sector could be integrated better into social prescribing. So we set up a study with around seven different museums across the south of England, across London and Kent. We work with a whole range of different museums, from big national museums like the British Museum through to small local authority museums like Tunbridge Wells Museum and the Beanie House of Art and Knowledge, which is a fantastic museum in Canterbury. What we're interested in is how we could connect up museums with services and organisations within their local health authorities to tackle issues around loneliness, for, particularly for older adults. So what we helped do is set up referral programmes. We identified with those referral organisations individuals who could be referred to a museum based social prescribing programme. And the museums designed a 10 week programme for those individuals. And these are individuals, most of the individuals who work with were individuals who not only had never visited museum, but many never left their house apart from going to visit um, a hospital or their GPs. So what we're really interested in is how could museum based activities support individuals in these um, museum based programmes. And the museums designed the programmes, 
um, in collaboration with the participants. They did a whole range of different activities, really depending on what those, in, those individuals' interests were and what the museums had to offer. A lot of it was focused uh, around museum-based activities like object handling, creating guides, tours, having talks, um, the, and there was very much an emphasis on co-design. What we did is look at um, whether there were improvements in psychological well-being, which we saw. We found statistically significant improvements in psychological well-being. But the really interesting thing for us was uh, looking and having conversations with all those different individuals, both the participants and those referrers and the museums themselves and the people that were uh, all the stakeholders who worked together to form the social prescribing programme. And as you can see from uh, the, the list of improvements that we saw, we got to see really brilliant improvements in things like perceptions of quality of life, sense of belonging, and really important learning and acquisition of new skills, which for all of our different research projects that we've done with many different audiences always comes out as really important and happy to talk more about that. But the key thing really for us was audiences talking about healthier lifestyle changes, which I think is really important. And that's fantastic. But this is a 10 week intervention programme to get people into a new community based activity programme. And what's really needed is, is sustained engagement within these sorts of programmes. And that's, I think, where the real difficulties come. And, and that's what I'd like to talk about going forward. Over the past two years, um, we, like Michael Mommet, have been focused very much on what's been happening with community organisations throughout COVID. And as many of as you will know, um, the, the community sector really, really um, stood up to the challenge in terms of COVID. And we saw just some amazing offers from very small locally based community organisations through to big national organisations, um, really stepping up um, and supporting their local communities. And what we were interested in is through a whole mixture of different types of evidence collating was to understand how all of these different organisations were working and operating within their communities to support the most vulnerable people within those communities. So we did a whole load of questionnaires and surveys um, and reaching out to both those community organisations and the audiences that they were working with and also the people in between who were helping to connect individuals within communities with resources in the community. And we worked with a huge range of organisations, organisations that were very small, locally run, things like food banks run by a few volunteers managing as, long, as well as their day jobs that they were doing on Zoom, through to museums, libraries, um, cultural organisations, parks and green spaces to understand essentially what they were doing, but also to, understood, to understand what worked, but also what some of the challenges were that they were facing. This is what people told us they were doing during community COVID. We saw a huge range of different types of activities. Um, I won't read through all of these, but um, a lot of this is really linked to the different sorts of restrictions that were in place during COVID. Um, so things like uh, gardening and opportunities for gardening became, became important for people. Uh, increased engagement in kind of arts and crafts and those sorts of activities and opportunities to do fitness. Um, but what was interesting was that whilst all of us were, were living uh, online, people wanted to do offline activities. Um, but what was also interesting is that people wanted to uh, take part in activities much more often than they did before COVID, which I think has presented a fantastic opportunity for those organisations thinking about going forward in relation to their activities post COVID when restrictions have stopped. Um, and I won't read through all of these because I think you've got copies of, of these slides, but we know that there's many positive aspects of engagement in these sorts of activities psychological improvements in psychosocial aspects of health, physical benefits of engagement in different uh, outdoors activities as well as indoors activities, the opportunity to focus on things like creativity to forget the wider pressures. But we also find lots of uh, um, negative aspect to taking part in activities. Uh, and again, I won't read through all of these, but things that, again, we have to think about when we're talking about inequalities is things like the materials and costs of materials and costs of activities, buying tools, the opportunity to have the right technical equipment, having the right technical skills to be able to engage in essentially computer or, or, or phone based activities, difficulty in using things like on, on uh, online platforms. So it's really important, I think, to understand both those positive and negative aspects for individuals who are not from typical backgrounds who are using community assets to think about how we might engage those communities. 
And again, it won't read through all these sorts of barriers, but issues of lack of digital literacy, the lack of its sufficient resources, and of course, opportunities to participate. So of course, people living in the most deprived areas, part of the reason that they're living in that area of dep deprivation is because they have limited opportunities and there are limited resources. Their local library might have been closed down. They might not have a community centre. They might not have any resources. Their green spaces might not be um, accessible to them for various reasons. So again, for community organisations, it's really important, I guess, thinking about what those barriers are, particularly for people um, who are not typical users for those um, resources, and particularly for vulnerable audiences who might be from those most deprived communities. We spent a lot of time thinking about what some of those barriers were, um, and some of those barriers are around the social, psychosocial barriers to engaging in, in um, community assets and community resources. We saw in COVID, of course, a lot of data and our data supported that around loneliness. And we saw levels of loneliness were slightly above average. Um, we actually found that people who were most isolated were in the age bracket of 30 to 59, which might uh, be not what everybody um, would be expecting, but also that the people who felt they were most left out were people who were in the above 60 category. We also saw a direct correlation between well-being and loneliness. And again, this is not new. Many other studies found that there was a decrease in well-being, which was significantly associated with an increase in loneliness. And those, I think, psychosocial barriers to participation are always uh, really important to think about as well. I guess some of the most interesting work we did was working with those health professionals who were working at the cold face. So people like social prescribing link workers, social workers, third sector workers, charity workers and other sorts of community professionals. Um, and we had lots of fantastic, but also quite heartbreaking conversation with those in, uh, in individuals who were really at the front line of tackling um, some of the greatest inequalities that had occurred that Michael has talked about during COVID. Um, many of them talked about forming very new and interesting partnerships with community organisations and working, for, them, for example, with local risk registers, for example, connecting up a food bank, say, with a museum or another type of community organisation. So organisations who wouldn't typically work together, who were then wanting to work together to support some of those uh, issues. Um, and many felt that their work was being positively impacting participants, but they weren't really able to accurately reflect this because they were simply so overworked and so overwhelmed, but also because they don't have the right tools or measurements or methods available to them to evidence the impact that they are having or that the sorts of work they're involved in is having on those individuals. And this is a, a phrase that, particularly from link workers, where they talked specifically about that they have to wear many hats. So they would be transitioning between a sort of social worker and a vaccine coordinator. So not able to do that frontline work as effectively because they have other demands on their time. And we know from our ongoing conversations with individuals like community navigators and link workers that those sorts of challenges still persist today. So we found um, that we found really great creative health partnerships in an, and unexpected collaborations, which we know are continued today. So that's a really positive outcome, I think, from community organisations and how they responded to COVID. But we also found significant barriers to participation. So I think what this shows is that we really can quite clearly articulate the changing needs of a health service, but also the fragility of this community ecosystem. So as we move towards a time of integrated care, those two aspects I think really need to be looked at. And that's something that we're working on now in relation to thinking about how community organisations can help to address inequalities. So what we're really interested in is we're working closely with UK research, organisations like the National Academy for Social Prescribing and the National Centre for Creative Health, alongside the NHS and things like the LGA, the Local Governments Association, to try and tackle some of these sorts of questions. So how community assets and social prescribing could be repositioned to support the individuals who face the most severe individuals. So that's really about those targeted programmes uh, that Michael was talking about. How can we target service use towards the people who need it most? And particularly, for example, how the, those systemic barriers can be addressed to deploy more assets, community assets more effectively. And I know that I'm running a, a little bit short on time, so I'm going to whiz through just because I wanted to raise awareness of a, a new funding opportunity that we've been working on with UK Research, which is a collaboration across all the different uh, research organisations within UK Research which is specifically about the work that community 
cultural and natural organisations and assets can do to make themselves more effectively tackling health disparities. So we've just uh, launched a new multi-year transdisciplinary research programme, which is all about bringing academics and community organisations together to think about health inequalities. So part of that is my role is working with those organisations. So far, I've persuaded them to spend about 20 million on it. I'm hoping to encourage them to spend a little bit more. We've just announced the first phase um, of our funding, which has funded a whole series of organisations specifically to work around these new integrated care systems. Um, I won't go into lots of details about those. I don't know how much people have heard about integrated care systems. Um, they are a new approach to both funding and organising health and social and community care services across regions and across organisations. They replace what people might have heard of as clinical commissioning groups. Um, and they, I think, provide a new opportunity. So there is a statutory responsibility for ICSs to work with the VCSE sector, the voluntary uh, communities and social enterprise sector. But at the minute, no effective or standardised models for them to work together. And that's what this grant programme is all about. How can those different groups of organisations work together effectively to tackle inequalities within those communities? So, so far, we funded around 12 pilot projects across the UK. We funded a whole series of different types of collaborations, things around, for example, wild swimming, um, with audit, different types of audiences who wouldn't typically get into wild swimming and how those wild swimming organisations can work with local authorities and social prescribing and GPs to get more individuals into wild swimming and what the benefits to that sort of collaboration might be. We, we funded stuff around rural heritage and how rural heritage can be mobilised to think about supporting rural health needs. And what we're doing at the sort of national level is trying to bring the sorts of learning from these locally based programmes and hyper local examples of community based wor working around health inequalities, how that might be scaled up. So how we're working with organisations like the NHS's personalised care group and other organisations to think about how these sorts of opportunities might be scaled up. And we've just announced another funding call, which some of you might be interested in, which is really all about how we might build cons research consortiums to bring together different types of academics, people like, Mar like Michael Marmot, alongside people like health economists and people who are working within e in communities, as well as those community organisations and as well as those health partners. So we're looking to award uh, grants of up to £250,000 to bring together different participants, different stakeholders and different researchers to try and tackle these more complex thorny issues around community collaboration, particularly around integration with health partners. And what's really exciting about this programme is that although the principal investigator has to be from a university, the co-investigators can come from any organisation that isn't an industry partner. So they could come from a community organisation, they could come from a local authority, they could come from housing services or psych adult psychological care within a local authority, for example, or somebody within an NHS trust. So for the first time, what we're hoping is that we can bring together different voices to tackle some of these complicated issues around service integration and tackling these wider ecosystem problems. So if you're interested in that, do give me a shout. I put a web link in there for you when we're running some webinars to provide more information. So please do drop me a line if you're interested to know about that. And just finally, I know I'm running out of time, but um, since we're talking about education and that's something that's very close to my heart because I still uh, teach a lot and think it's really important to integrate the sorts of research we're doing and the great work that people like Michael Montman do into the education of our new generations of scholars. And so to that end, we've created a completely new qualification at UCL, which took me about three years to get UCL to agree. <laughs> to it's a completely new qualification it's a master's of arts and sciences recognizing that we need interdisciplinary approaches we need interdisciplinary minds and we need collaborative working to understand and tackle these very complex challenges and when we use the word creative health which is the name of our first master's in uh, of arts and sciences what we're talking about is health creation and using create, uh, creative assets and community assets to create health for everybody the term comes from the all-party parliamentary group's report called creative health which is around the arts for health and well-being that actually can equally be applied to other kinds of uh, community and natural and blue and green space assets 
and we took our first cohort uh, of masters in creative health uh, students this last September and what's been really exciting is that many of our students are mature students and have come from very very different backgrounds um, and the real focus, I guess, is that many of them have come from arts backgrounds or working within different aspects of the health service. We've got an occupational therapist, we've got a lot of psychotherapists, um, is that those individuals, I think, are really looking to learn to work in different ways, collaboratively and collegiately to tackle some of these issues around health inequalities. Uh, what's also been really exciting for me is that those students come from very different backgrounds. Not all of them have a first degree, which is uh, almost unheard of at master's level, particularly in, in the Russell Group universities. And it's taken us a long time to encourage the university to think about a different kind of education and a different way of educating people from different backgrounds within the university context. So I thought I'd just end with that uh, as a way to think about how we can um, bring different people into the sphere of thinking about tackling health inequalities through more creative and health creation approaches through this more collegiate and collaborative uh, approach to working. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me and looking forward to a, a discussion, a wider discussion. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, Professor Chatterjee, that's great.